God came to you and asked you to give 100% of your possessions to the poor, could you pull that off? There's a couple of stories in the scriptures where God asks uh, someone to give everything. Uh, One is found in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10. It's page 822 in the Bible that's in the chair in front of you. It's oftentimes called the rich young ruler. It's a story about a young man who was able to keep the Ten Commandments of God. He was very religious, but he wasn't able to follow the commands of Jesus Christ. He was very rich, but was his heart able to honor Jesus? Well, let's find out. Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran into him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, and the question that this young rich man poses really is a question that he is not satisfied with life. Like he's amassed all this wealth. He probably has all these possessions. He has charge of probably a lot of servants. But one thing he doesn't have, he doesn't have peace with God. Verse 18, Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Some of you guys know there's 10 commandments that God had brought down from Mount Sinai to Moses. Moses came down with two tablets. On the first tablet are all the ways in which we relate to God. On the second tablet were all the ways in which we're to relate to each other. What Jesus asked of this man was, are you following the first tablet or the second tablet? Here's what the guy says. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Uh, Meaning, I, I relate good to people. But my relationship with God's not very good. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So here's a guy that uh, was able to follow the rules of God, but struggled following the rule maker. He had the religion all down, you know, the the stuff that you do externally, but the relationship, the things that happen internally, the heart issue, he couldn't quite get get a hold of it. He could follow the commands, but he struggled following Christ. Contrast this with this story in Mark chapter 12, just a few pages to the right, starting in verse 41, Jesus is attending a worship service, and he is found himself a position in the service where he can view people giving the offering. (laughs) How intimidating would that be? You start to give an offering and you notice Jesus out of the corner of the eye. Do you put a few more dollars in the plate? I do, I'll tell you that. And so he's viewing the the wealthy pass through, he's viewing the poor pass through and he can hear how much they're giving because they are putting their money in these big vases that are probably made out of bronze. They have a big funnel top to them and the rich are coming in and they're throwing in handfuls of change and he can hear how much they are putting in and the poor are coming and they're putting just small amounts of change and he can hear the few coins drop and he witnesses this next scene in verse 41, Mark chapter 12. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all others. Maybe Jesus is more concerned about how we honor him than he is the amount that we give to him. Verse 44, they all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put everything put in everything, all she had to live on. Let me, let me just recap what, what, what has been done here in both these stories. Both have been asked to give 100% of what they have over to God. One was directly asked to give his great wealth over to the Lord, sell it off and give it to the poor. And he said no and walked away sad. God, I can't honor you with what I have. Another was convicted by God 
to give all that she has, 100%, everything she has to live on and honor the Lord with it. And apparently her heart surrendered long before her money ever did. There, there's a word that's being used over and over again. If you haven't picked it up, it's the word honor. Honor and giving have a lot to do with one another. Proverbs chapter three, verse nine says it like this. Honor the Lord with, with your wealth and with the, with the best part of everything you produce. Now, that's not always true. It's not always true of us. We don't always give the best part. Sometimes we give the leftover part of our budget over to the Lord. Whatever remains, we hand to him. But, but then God says, you give me the best, then, then he will fill your barns with grain. Your vats will overflow with good wine. You honor me, I'll bless you. Let's just talk about this honoring of God because God is probably not gonna ask you to give 100%. He's probably not gonna come to you and say, sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. But you know what he will ask of every believer? He's asking you to honor him with 100%. Now, now, what does that look like? As a believer, what does that look like? If God is asking us to honor him with 100% of what we have, what does that look like? Well, let's just take the big purchases we have in life, the big things that we own. Like, let's just take our house for a moment. How do you honor God with your home? Well, maybe you just start by saying, God, listen, mi casa es su casa. My house is your house. And anytime someone needs a place to stay, I'm gonna find room for them to stay. If I need to move a kid out of a bed and put them on the couch, or maybe I just have an open couch that they can sleep on. Maybe I got a place where they can just, down, down in the basement, they could just have a night's rest. Uh, maybe it's I've got a, an empty spot at the dinner table and there's always seems to be leftovers. I'm just gonna welcome someone in who needs a place to stay. No, I'm gonna welcome someone in who just needs a friend today. I just need somebody by their side today. They just, I'm just gonna have my door open to whomever, God, however you choose, however you lead. You know, we are a church of small groups and what we're recognizing as pastors is more small groups are moving into the building rather than being in the home. And small groups work best when someone is hospitable, opens up their home. People can just kind of relax on couches and people can just meal around the kitchen and just do life together. Someone just needs to open up their home and say, God, my house is your house. I recognize why you gave it to me. You know, I'm always amazed on how our folks do that around here. Dan and Susan Yoakum uh, attend this church. Dan's one of our elders. I, I am always amazed on how quick they are to open up their home, especially to those that, that come in as interns to this place. And, you know, interns stay for six to eight months, and they're just so quick to say, we got a, we got a room, you can stay here, you can live with us and at no charge, and you can just crash here. If you want to talk to us, you can talk to us. If you want to raid the kitchen, you can raid the kitchen. If you want to hang out in front of the TV, you can hang out in front of the TV. Mi casa es su casa. My house is your house. I just want to bless you with what God has given to me. Hey, how can you, how can you start honoring God with what he's given to you? Maybe it's uh, an interest or a hobby that you have and you've amassed a bunch of possessions because of that hobby. Like you have a classic car and you now how do you honor God with a classic car? You got an extensive tool collection how do you honor God with that extensive tool collection? It's a boat, it's a jet ski, it's a motor home, it's an extra house. How do you honor God with that? Again, I'm always amazed on how our folks here at Bethany get away with this. Jonathan Parker, who attends church here, he is an excellent practical shooter. You say, what's a practical shooter? Well, he competes all around the nation, running around targets and shooting the targets on the run as fast as he can. He's nationally ranked. He's quite impressive with a handgun. And a couple weeks ago, he decided to organize an event for some guys in the church that he just simply called Coffee, Donuts, and Guns. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to come to that? Three of my favorite things. Coffee, donuts, guns. And so he scheduled time at the Sportsman's Club here in Washington, got all of his firearms together, his, his rifles, his handguns, laid out all the ammo we needed for the day, targets, got everything organized, got guys there who you can mentor and minister to. And we shot his firearms. And then he, he taught us some skills on how to be better marksmen. How are you honoring God with what you have? 
Okay, think, think far beyond the material things because God's probably not asking you to give 100%, but he's asking you to honor, honor him with 100%. How can you honor God as a parent or maybe as an employee or a boss or as a child? How do you honor him with your job or with your family? You know, every day there's a prayer that comes out of my mouth that is something to this essence. Lord, may I and my family be a blessing to you and to others. How do you, how do you start being a blessing to others? How do you start honoring God with what you have? You know, this, yesterday, our family ministry team hosted a child dedication. And uh, families came together and they decided, we're not confirming our kids to the Lord. We're just committing ourselves to being parents that will raise our kids up in the Lord. And they all got together and they decided, God, we're going to honor you as parents we're going to do everything we can to honor you as we parent our kids so that they'll know and grow in you. How, how, how can you honor God with 100% of what you have? What is it that you need to start honoring God with what you have? For believers, there's really two choices that we have right now with this. Because God says, surrender your heart to me. And so with the things that we have, we can either redeem the things we're not using for God. We can redeem those resources that we're, we're holding back from him and we can start honoring him with them or we can release them. Because there's just some things in life that we find difficult that are keeping us, that are hindering us from really surrendering our life from God. We can redeem them or we can release them. And here is, here's why this is so important. It's because if we if we just start to get in the more mindset, we lose the ministry mindset. And the more mindset is just really filled with greed. And greed is one of those things that bars us from a surrendered heart. And let me just give you the baseline definition of greed. It's a selfish quest for more. And it puts us in this more mindset and it bars us from the ministry mindset where we're hoarding for ourselves rather than helping others. And let me tell you about the more mindset. It leads us to a place where we're envious, where we're jealous, and where we are uh, covet other, other people and what they have. And, and I know how we think of greed. We think, well, greed is reserved for those folks that we hear about that have found a way to skim money off the top of their organization. And so finally they're convicted and jailed because they've, they've skimmed like hundreds of thousands of dollars off the top. Those are the greedy people. Or we think about the person that shoplifts and we just go, boy, so greedy. Why can't they just pay or just have enough self-restraint not to grab and go? Or we think about those that maybe go so deep in debt to attain something they can't afford. And we say, boy, they're awfully greedy. But can I tell you the truth? What greed really spurs from? Greed really spurs from the errs that we have in our life. The errs. God would you make me prettier, healthier, skinnier, taller, smarter, richer, happier? That's where greed begins. I've got some, I just need a little bit more. We do this with our spouse. We do this with our possessions, our home, our cars, our bank account, our investments. We do this with our kids, our job, even our church, the Ur virus. And what happens is it creeps into us and we say we've got, we've got to have things better. We have to have things bigger than our neighbor. And that's where greed really begins. And can I tell you about the Ur virus? Here's what it does. It, it robs us of happiness. It robs us of our sanity and it robs us of our health. You want more, <laughs> so you buy more, so you spend more, so you have to work more, repeat until you die. And worse than that, here's what greed really does. Greed keeps us from honoring God with 100% of what we have like we've been asked. This is why Jesus is so emphatic about greed, and here's what he says, guard yourself against greed. He says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of 
possessions. And Jesus says, listen, don't get trapped into this more mindset. It is unquenchable. You'll always be thirsty for more. You're going to have to learn about this big word called contentment. So in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the apostle Paul instructs this young pastor named Timothy to be content in life. And here's what he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. That word content means to be fulfilled. That word content means to have peace. That word contentment means to be tranquil in life. Like it doesn't matter what you have, uh, your, your net worth is not bringing you your, your value. God's bringing you value. And so you're finding contentment in who God is. And so Paul encourages Timothy Timothy's to encourage his church as a young pastor with these next words in verse nine. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge him into ruin and destruction. People who long to get rich fall into these traps. And then it's a famous line, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And you know how many Christians have turned that around and said money is evil? Money, money's not evil. Money is neutral. How you use money could be good or bad, righteous or evil. And some people craving money, there's the issue, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And I think if you want to boil that teaching down, it basically is money is like a fire. It can be a powerful force for good, but it can also be very dangerous if you don't respect it. I heard about this business owner that was walking around his, his business and going to all the cubicles and talking to those in the office and just finding out kind of the, the morale, um, a long pandemic, just trying to get a, a sense of where his employees were. And he walked around and was talking to one lady and just asking her how her day went, how, how maybe things could get better here at the office. And she said, you know what would make me perfectly content as a $10 an hour raise. He said, you know what, I've, I've always wanted to meet someone perfectly content. So I'll tell you what, starting right now, we're gonna get you a $10 an hour race. He walked away from that conversation, started to mingle with others in the cubicle. He overheard her say, I should have asked for 20. <laughs> hey guys, that, that's exactly how greed works though, isn't it? There's never enough that will ultimately satisfy I wish I would have asked for more, even though I just got this huge blessing. The advice that Paul gives Timothy is beware of, beware of greed. Pursue something else because there is a pitfall that will happen, a bottomless pit. Greed is bottomless. God desires that we honor him with all that we have. Scripture teaches us to guard against greed because it will keep us from Honoring God. So how do you develop a God-honoring heart as it relates to our generosity? How do you do that? Well, if you get back into 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, the apostle Paul brings this advice to Timothy and to us. But you, Timothy, are a man of God. I love where he, he starts. Don't forget who you are and whose you are. Uh, you are a man of God, so run from these evil things. Don't pursue greed. Uh, pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. Hey, what Paul's really doing is he's laying out a pathway that you and I can take so that we can start leading a God-honoring life with all that we possess. But here's where it starts. It starts with a pursuit. Isn't that what Paul says? Pursue God daily. Chase after God and you'll start to flee from greed. So may it be your daily ambition to open up the scriptures before you check your stocks. It may be your daily ambition to begin your day with prayer rather than how you can increase your pay. May it be your desire to run your business ethically rather than greedily. May you rise up every single day trying to find ways in which you can leave a spiritual inheritance rather than a financial inheritance to your family. Hey guys, there's an important question that believers often aren't asking anymore. And it's not, how do I become happy in life? It's, how do I please God in this life? And once you realize that you can please God in this life, and then that's the source of happiness, not the opposite way around, you'll start getting fulfillment in life. That's why Paul says, godliness 
with contentment is great gain. Godliness will begin the fulfillment. Godliness will begin the purpose that you'll find in life. Not what makes me smile, but how do I bring glory to God? Hey, there's a pathway here that leads to godliness with contentment, and it continues on, not just to pursue God daily, but look what Paul has to say to Timothy in verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And it continues in verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And what Paul is ultimately advising is, be a good steward with the things that God has put into your possession. You know what a steward is? It's a biblical term that God owns and that we manage. God owns it and he's put it in your trust so that you can manage it well for him. And I know what often happens when we read scripture like that. Command those who are rich. And we all think, yeah, hey, you rich people, listen up. God's got a word for you. You know, I read an article recently that was simply titled, Income in Perspective, America's Poor Are Among the World's Wealthiest. Listen to some of the statistics that came out of this. If you make more than $10,000 a year in total household income, $10,000 a year in total household income, you are richer than 6 billion people on earth. You're richer than 84% of the world. Now, if you make more than $50,000 a year in total household income, you're richer than 99% of the rest of the world. Okay, you know how the politicians at times start to gripe and tell you how bad the 1% are? I'm looking at them. You dirty, filthy, rotten people. Now, I know we never put it in perspective like that because we always determine what rich is based off someone who has a little bit more than what we have. But I'm looking at a group of people here that have more than what 99% of the world has. And by every definition that the Apostle Paul says here to Timothy, command those who are rich, you are the very definition of that today. And Paul says, don't put your hope in riches, put your hope in the Lord which continues this pathway to honor God. Pursue God daily. Make him your pursuit. Number two, though, trust in God. Don't put your hope in riches. Hey, friend, God is worthy of your total trust. He is worthy of your total trust. That's ultimately what the widow woman was doing that day as she gave her offering. God, I trust you. It's better in your hands than it is in my hands. But the rich young ruler wasn't able to do that. He thought his wealth and his possessions were better off in his grip. Ultimately, God says, don't hoard. Hoard, Hoarding is not gonna bring you securities here on earth. It's not gonna bring you securities here on heaven. Really, hoarding's gonna keep you away from a lot of fulfillment here in this world. And Jesus tells this parable about a farmer that has a bumper crop. And so he decides to build more barns. He decides to build bigger grain bins and he harvests the crop and he puts it all away and he says, finally, finally, I've got everything I need and more. My life is secure. I can retire happy. I can eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus in that parable says that God says to that man, you fool, tonight your very life will be taken from you. And in Luke chapter 12, Jesus concludes that parable by saying this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. Like I thought that if he could hoard all the things in life, he would finally be fulfilled and secure in this world. And Jesus is ultimately teaching us all the wealth in this world will never buy you forgiveness of sin. All the possessions that you hold on to will never grant you the hope of eternal life, will never provide for you purpose, will never bring fulfillment to your world. You'll just move on to the next purchase. You'll just want a little bit more because that's what greed ultimately does. It's a more mindset, and it keeps you from a ministry mindset. Trust God. Pursue God. Here's the third way on that pathway 
to honoring God. Be generous. I know it sounds so simple, but, but just don't be miserly. Like if there's someone in need, give to those in need. Be quick to lend. Let someone borrow from you. If they ask, give it to them and don't expect it in return. God has blessed you with so many things, so be generous with it. You heard the old adage that you've been blessed to be a blessing? Boy, that's so true, that God has put blessings in your life so that you'll bless others with it. You know, most restaurants, generosity with a server is measured in percentages, isn't it? Uh, You get your receipt back, and then it will say, how much in gratuity would you like to give? And the starting line is 15%. Why? Because that's the baseline that our society has said is what is expected for just average service. Now, I suppose if you have bad service, you would probably give less than 15% to say to the server and to the restaurant, this is not what I expected, this was not up to par. But if the service is exceptional, you're going to give far beyond 15% to say, you did a great job, and this went far and above and beyond everything I expected tonight as we had our meal together. You know, God's standard for generosity in the Old Testament is also set at a percentage. His standard. Oh, it's not a gratuity. It's called a tithe. It's 10%, less than you would give a waiter or waitress. And in the New Testament, instructs us that we're to give as though we've been prospered. So he doesn't say there's a certain amount we should give, but there is a baseline 10% that I think God starts us at. And I think any time that we would give less than 10%, it would be an indication that we would believe that God's cheating us. Anytime we would give more, we're saying, God, you treat me better than I deserve. I am so blessed. I just want to be a blessing to other people. Hey, how about on this pathway to fight against greed and to start honoring God with 100% that you have? Start pursuing God daily. Start trusting him and don't put your hope in riches. How about be generous? Don't be miserly. Here's the fourth and final one. Just enjoy what you have. Just enjoy what you have. I mean, how often is it that you think about what you have and you go, well, that's good, but it's last year's model. Okay, that's wonderful, but I wish I had more saved up. Oh, that, that's amazing what we were able to do on vacation, but next, next year I want to go and do something bigger. Hey, why not just look back and say, God, I'm just thankful that you've blessed me with what I have right now in my life. Can you imagine if you gave your kid like an extravagant gift? And they open up the gift and they're so excited for it. It's exactly what they wanted. I mean, they've said they've wanted it for so long and you decided to splurge and really bless your child. And they open up that gift and there's tons of enjoyment and there's amazement. And after they unpackage it, they quickly look at it and they set it on the shelf and they never revisit it again. Now, what kind, what kind of gratitude would that show to you, the gift giver? If they've already like moved on and said, well, thanks, but no thanks. It was what I wanted, but now I've moved on from that. It doesn't mean much to me anymore. And yet when we ask God to provide and fail to say thank you, imagine how he looks at his kids when we've moved on and said, God, that was great and all, but I just want a little bit more. I just need a little bit more. And God looks over our inventory and says, hey, How about you just enjoy what you got right now? There'll be blessings to come, but how about you just start to enjoy what you have right now? And Christians, let me just just say this. Let me just speak off the cuff for a moment. Some of you, you get really guilty when you have a nice meal or you get guilty because you drive maybe a nice car or because you have a nice home or because you went on a nice vacation. You know, God doesn't want you feeling guilty for that stuff. If you have earned your money honestly and you give generously and you trust God exclusively, God wants you to enjoy what he has blessed your life with. You just start to honor him with all that you have.
We get 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, command those who are rich, that's all of us, in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. But let's, let's just read this phrase that's underlined out loud together, okay? But to put their hope in God. This is where this begins and ends. This is where honoring begins and ends. To put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. This is what the widow woman did. She put her hope and trust in the Lord. God already had her heart. The money was not an issue. She was able to give her two cents and she was able to say, God, you not only have all of me, I'm gonna be completely dependent on you for all that I, I need. And friends, she was expressing more than just a commitment to God. She was expressing her faith in God that God will take care of me when I honor him. All right, Christians, listen. What is it that's keeping you from honoring God with 100% of what you have? What is it? And do you need to release it? Or do you need to redeem it? All right, for some of you in this room who believe in Jesus, but you have never stepped out in faith, you're thinking about making some commitments for Christ, but you're not there yet. I would love to say to you, this doesn't mean anything to you. Because before Jesus wants your dollars, he wants your desires. Before he wants your cash, he wants your choices. Before he wants your lip service, he wants your life. Because the truth is, Christ has given you the greatest gift. It's the gift of eternal life. And it's a gift that he is waiting for you to receive. Could you imagine uh, at Christmas, all the gifts are under the tree. Everyone comes and gathers and collects their gift and everyone opens them up and you decide for whatever reason, I know those gifts under the tree are for me. I'm just gonna leave them there. I don't want them. I don't wanna open them. I know they, they got my name on it, but I'm just gonna leave it. Now, who does that? Christ has left you a gift. The gift of forgiveness of sins, the gift of a relationship with God the Father, and he's waiting for you to receive him and for you to welcome him into your life. As the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse one, that we are to be living sacrifices that we're to give ourselves over to God and live for him. And that begins when we're born again in the baptistry. And if you want to put your hope in Jesus and not in the things of this world, then in just a moment, we're going to provide for you an invitation so that you can take a step of faith and make Christ the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords of your life. Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you today. <clears throat> And we know that not in every way have we honored you with all the things that we own and possess. So show us what needs to be redeemed and show us today what maybe needs to be released because we want a surrendered heart towards you. Father, for those in this room today that need to make decisions for you, now your spirit is working in their life right now, convicting them. Father, I pray they make those, those faith steps today to meet with the pastor, to be baptized into Christ, to have their sins forgiven, and to start on a new walk with you. Father, may we today make some steps of faith, honoring you with all that we have and all that we are. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.